Let's see uh, why we need a, a new pedagogy. These are some of the reality we live uh, every day in. No comment needed. Education is very important, mainly in my opinion because it's a part of the social construction of reality. And nowadays, in the so-called Anthropocene era, uh, we need to face, badly need, all the havoc, all the problem, mostly man-made. And why? Well, in my opinion, greed, of course, is an explanation, but also ignorance, alienation, feeling not part of my community, of my environment, and also, in my opinion, some of the fault lie with traditional education that has been uh, actually sometimes not helping. Uh, so, a relevant uh, question, in my opinion, is how our personal and social selves identity are socially structured, you know, are socially construed. I think uh, <clears throat> also another important question is how we structure reality is giving us uh, tools uh, to deal with the emergency we have to face. Just this, the World Health Organization calculated that in 12, so now it's worse, about 12.6 million deaths were you know, occurring somehow connected with problem of the environment that we pollute. 22% of the burden of disease uh, is due to environmental uh, attack to health and well-being. And for kids under five years old, 26%, more than a quarter, is uh, due to bad influence, uh, bad impact uh, of uh, environmental risk. So, as I said, education is a very important aspect of the social construction of reality and is at the same time a process, getting a, you know, education, like it's a process in the family, of course, that starts first, but also it's a product. And this could be good news or very bad news. Why? Because dysfunctional education, an education that doesn't give you the tools to see, and to act uh, is uh, dysfunctional and uh, give us, uh, as a result, uh, real damages. So, since uh, education, uh, science, are the new, the narrative uh, to prepare new citizenship, a new generation, uh, uh, they are really empowering tools but if the tools are not effective, actually they are disempowering. It's like uh, nowadays we know how much damage disseminate fake news uh, uh, is. Disseminate uh, false signs, uh, superstition signs, uh, thinking that, that uh, the environment uh, is just for our use, it's a commodity. It's like going to the supermarket, chopping down uh, wood, uh, wood because we need wood. So, we need uh, to have a, a sustainable education based on reality, that is based on people needs, that is uh, a people-centered education, uh, and is uh, scientifically grounded uh, of our you know, current knowledge uh, with how people learn and develop their potentials. And uh, going quickly, 
student-centered education, we have a, a lot of research. For example, uh, if you're interested, you'll see some uh, <clears throat> biblio uh, opportunity. 47 million students uh, we have researched in the past years all over the world. Uh, and we know that student-centered education uh, pedagogy is congruent uh, with the present scientific knowledge derived from the word uh, of uh, psychology, sociology, anthropology, neuroscience, and so forth. Also, research showed that it's more effective than traditional top-down professor teaching student instead of uh, the professor, the teaching, being a, a promoter of learning. And uh, it's more effective uh, than a traditional education, even if the subject is about the hard sciences, uh, mathematics, biology, uh, computer technology, e-learning. <laughs> the better outcome uh, are uh, showing that uh, they work uh, no matter of the student population of the country, of the gender, and the culture. Among the many positive results, uh, better achievement of educational goal, um, better attendance, uh, more satisfaction, better morale, better self-image, uh, more critical thinking, better problem solving, better relationship between students uh, in and uh, outside the classroom is socializing and less destructive behavior or dropping out of school. Person-centered, student-centered, people-centered education also is an effective form of peace education because they learn how to listen, to work uh, together, to be empathic uh, and understand each other, to develop intimacy and trust, to <clears throat> basically uh, develop uh, their individual social health uh, and uh, to develop not only their potentiality, but uh, as well facilitate the development and uh, climate developing uh, in the classroom, but also in the community. In other words, they learn how to learn. That, in my opinion, is more important than just learning the single subject. Of course, they have to know the single subject. We are not uh, excluding that at all. But uh, they have to learn uh, self-respect, respect for others. But it's not enough. Because depending on what kind of pedagogy that we have uh, always at uh, the bottom of the pedagogy, the vision of our human nature. If uh, we have a vision that human nature has at disposal all the resources uh, of the planet, uh, we're really doing damage. We have to foster awareness and capacity to effectively relate, not only to people, not only to different genders, not only to different sexual orientation, not only different melanin contact of the skin, we have uh, to relate uh, to life and not to see a tree that is uh, going to be a lot of toothpicks, uh, not, not to see animals, just how we can cook them. We have to see that we are part of life. So, since the time uh, is uh, rushing, but not yet uh, the two minutes uh, signal, so I'm going to give uh, the good example. I, I think uh, we dramatically need, uh, before it's too late, uh, to effectively protect and promote uh, human and environment capital. We need to think uh, globally, but uh, every day act locally. And I mean, uh, I need uh, to say these nice words, uh, but I have to go home uh, and relate this way to my wife relate this way to my colleagues, relate this way to my neighbor, even those I don't like that much. Otherwise, these are just words, and these are, again, one of the many things 
that are part of the problem, not of the solution. Thank you. And now, next, let me put the glasses up. We have a and sneak of the system approach of public innovation and responsible research in Brussels, which is Belgium, and is also on the board of the European chapter of the Club of Rome. Please, Anne, as you know, 12 minutes. Thank you. Uh, I was triggered by the the, in, the invitation to this conference, there is this gap between education and the current societal reality. It's still not quite clear to me whether the biggest gap is between education and the fourth industrial revolution or education and the sixth extinction, which one is more urgent. But anyway, this gap between how we thought about it, what were we thinking about education and what kind of thinking do we need today is what triggered me as I'm a philosopher of education. So the question is, what were we thinking? And then, you know, secondly, can we trust our own thinking to detect the errors in our own thinking? Or is that like the Baron of Munchausen pulling himself by his hair out of the morass? So maybe instead of thinking, we should think about or, you know, explore other ways of learning. So usually when I talk to learners, and they can be students or they can be uh, higher education teachers, I, I, I start with a story that I uh, learned from Jared Diamond about the Vikings that colonized about a thousand years ago. They colonized uh, Greenland. There was like a temporary mild climate and there were some green valleys. And there was a communi community of Inuit living there. They were hunter-gatherers and they had ice houses and uh, they had you know, warmed their houses and had light from the, the, the oil from the whales that they caught. So their technology and their economy was totally in line with the way they, they saw their own culture and they lived there and they were very happy. And then the, then the Vikings arrived and they, uh, they, they started agriculture, not just hunter-gatherer, but agriculture. They built wooden houses, they even built churches and a very beautiful cathedral. They had ships that they could do international trade with to import glass. So then I usually ask the, the learners, who do you think has the most advanced uh, system, the most advanced socio-economic system? Is it the Inuit or is it the Viking? And that helps them to reflect on, if they say the Viking, why do, why do you say that? What is your implicit uh, idea about advancement, human advancement, you know, education, emancipation? And so, usually very interesting answers come up. You know, they, I, I give them the time to reflect and all the answers are welcome. There's not a right and a wrong answer because it's a complex story, of course. And then I finish with, you know, how does the story end? I show them that the Inuit, who were like totally within the, the living within the boundaries of that, uh, like what you see here, you know, the, the biophysical processes at that, Latin, that part of the planet. So the Viking, the Inuit were totally uh, in harmony with that, in, is both in their, their idea of what a good life is and in their economics and technology. Whereas the Viking considered themselves superior, more advanced, you know, superior uh, uh, identity, but after 450 years, they starved to death. And the very interesting thing is that they preferred to starve to death rather than give up their cultural identity and learn from the Inuit the more appropriate economic and technological uh, means to live, to survive in that region. So then the question, of course, I ask the learners, like, why do I tell you this story? And they also come up with very interesting uh, answers. The, co the question is, of course, you know, are we any wiser than the, than the Vikings? That is the big question. And then I show them this slide uh, that was also shown by Carlos Alvarez Pereira. We are, uh, you know, the, the bottom line is the Human Development Index. It's combining... Um, education, life expectancy, and uh, income per capita. It's a combined metric. And you can see that what, this is how we have defined and organized develop, human development. We have defined it in, such a, in a way that does not take into account the reality of the planet, because on the left, the vertical axis, you see the number of planets we need to realize that kind of uh, development. So we are totally in overshoot. And a part of that, of course, is that we have organized, we organize health and education 
by taxing the economic growth, you know, per, the percentage of that goes to uh, education. So we always will deplete, the, we have an extractive economic system and part of it is re, uh, redistributed for education and health. And what I learned yesterday is that health now today is more and more pressured also to, pro, you know, to contribute to the growth, to be commercial, etc. So here we have a perfect vicious uh, circle. And then you can show that uh, how that works. You know, are we any wiser than the Vikings? We are definitely also locked in into this mental uh, state that does not allow us to react to the sixth extinction and the climate change that is coming. We have defined economy in such a way, or organized economy in such a way, that the growth of the economy as a subsystem has become the goal. Prosperity is a goal in itself, and people and planet you know, are resources, human resource or human capital, and planetary resources. So because we, this, this growth model is incompatible with the real growth of the, the biophysical processes, the, the, the speed at which you know, the solar energy and the, the materials can replenish the, what we call the resources, you know, the, the biophysical processes, they get scarce, uh, especially because we also use non-renewables a lot. So they get scarce, so there's a huge a competition for these scarce materials. So people are getting more and more pushed to become competitive. You know, education has to make our children competitive. And it's a vicious circle. So it's a really a race to the bottom, and we don't know if we're going to get out of that in, in time. And in the background of that, you know, Indo-European um, Indo uh, cultures, very, very old, we're talking centuries back, have this, it, this deep-rooted idea that uh, man was created in the image of God, as the culmination of a creation, you know, we are above nature, we are not part of nature, we are above nature, and God has given nature to us as a, as a resource to use for our whims. And scientists have kicked God out, but they hold on to this image that they can now rewrite the book of life, they are playing, they're playing homo deus right now, and nature is still the resource for us to use. That is the deep, you know, the Viking consideration that we have. And the result is that we're like uh, running an, an, an old car in a closed garage, closed garage because the CO2 in our planet is going nowhere. So if we stop the engine, we stop the car, like our current economic system will suffer, collapse, whatever, no jobs. If we don't stop this, stop the, the, this engine, we will also suffer and maybe, you know, go extinct. So with that, you know, we go back to the, what I call, this is like, a, um, it's a very complex and non-linear a system, like you saw the, the line of the, the, the Viking, it went up, they were very successful and then all of a sudden it collapses. So this is like a, a tool that helps the learners to make sense of that, uh, to map the complexity of our current society. You see autocatalysis or autopoiesis in the top, you know, you, you know Prigozhin, I, ho I hope. We are now evolving to the next level of complexity. Uh, we also have entropy, um, I'm not going into details there. We have the sun and the moon together with uh, the minerals, etc., that together create uh, an isolated system. There's, you know, first law of thermodynamics, nothing, nothing is coming in. We have what, you know, our patterns of making sense of life and death. How do we define a quality life, the good life? How do we define that? And then what means have we created to access the biophysical re resources, you know, basis, to fulfill that, what we have defined as our dream, as our vision of culture. And I call that ET because it's, you know, it's economic and uh, technology. It's like a, uh, the double helix, you know, they, they sort of like uh, make this growth, make this growth uh, keep going. Uh, and I think that the very important ones and the ones that are, are often, um, sorry, often overlooked is the, the importance of the money system in here. And of course, the population size, you know, those are very often omitted from the, from the systemic maps that we use. And uh, this, and of course, then the, 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 you know, the human brain, the patterning instincts, uh, you know, how are we wired <laughs> so that all this uh, goes together. And you, all the arrows show that, the, you know, these things interact with each other in nonlinear ways, in complex ways, etc. So this tool helps young people to say, if we say now, for example, we're going to change from, um, uh, non-renewable fossil fuel uh, energy to, you know, mm -hmm. keep that intact, you know, not change this and not change the model of growth. We're just going to change the technology from non-renewable to renewable. Is that compatible with the map? And then they can say no, because you're using scarce minerals. 
you're still, in, you know, you're, you're, you're play, replacing one problem, the CO2, with another problem, you know, the, the, the entropy, the dissipation of the rare minerals that we need, you know, the, for, the battery, for the capture and the storage of the energy. So that helps them to detect what are real solutions. Uh, and I give them exam uh, exercises, for example, explain how antibiotics, that was a fantastic innovation. So we thought, oh, I have an illness, I take a pill, I get healthy. So the more pills, the more health. And all of a sudden, nonlinearity, antibiotics are the biggest problem ever. So they, they learn to, pr to work with this. And then, of course, after all this bad news, I come up with the good news, and I say that we have now the agenda to go, go back into that, you know, that bottom square is the SDGs. We're going to create human well-being within planetary boundaries. To do that, we're going to have to reinvent the ET, the ET from extraterrestrial economic and technology to technology and economics that are responsible and resilient in the Anthropocene, Terra means, and uh, by peaceful cooperation and not economic warfare. So, you know, this is the same, the, the goals uh, on the Anthropocene map. And then I also show, show them very important that we have now different lines. We still have the extractive gro growth line, which is like the Viking line that was, is, it is collapsing. I mean, we don't know exactly when, what will collapse. But I also show them that since 1972, the first report of the Club of Rome, I'm a little bit biased, you know, but okay, it's a beautiful symbolic date. There is a different, the light blue line is involving, I've taken, um, the turquoise, you know, as a, as a second tire color, um, that is, you know, committed to bringing us back under this under the ceiling of the biophysical processes. And this is the SDGs, is the is the economic growth model uh, that is in SDG eight. It will will have new uh, economic mo uh, technologies and, and economic models that help us to go back into the you know create human progress uh, within planetary boundaries. And then I show them a lot of examples where that already happens. It's not the smart house because that is not future proof if you look at the Anthropocene map, but going back to biomimicry, like what Carlos also said, we can learn a lot from Africa. And this is happening. We have community land trust instead of, you know, speculation on ground. We have uh, uh, different uh, building, style, building techniques with local materials and local communities doing the work, community supported agriculture, two libraries, etc. And then of course, we, oh sorry, we need the institutions to upscale that, you know, like uh, the European Commons Assembly is the legal part, uh, we have networks, we have education, training here, to, to make, uh, we have community currencies here, uh, you know, all this, and this creates a virtuous circle for uh, you know, regenerative culture, for uh, achieving all these, you know, these central goals for well-being, etc. And so the four, I, I hope I don't offend anybody with my terminology, I did not want to talk about the four pillars of education because a pillar is dead and static and linear. It's, I, I took placentas, I couldn't come up with anything better. Please of, conclude. Uh, very yeah, okay. Quickly. So I think it's, you have to give young people hope by showing this, oh, the, showing this, uh, sorry showing this light, uh, light blue line. Hope is very important. Um, and then, uh, oh, sorry. Can you please bring back the placenta? Yeah, sorry, I have to. Oh, I don't know what's happening. Oh, okay, I got it, okay. So I, I will not use the pointer. So this is, you know, give them hope, say this is happening. It's already happening. It's full of alternatives that do what Eric was saying this morning, this more functional economy. It's happening, it's out there, it's just under the radar of, of politics, economics, academia, press. We don't talk about it, but it's there, it's the emergence is there. And then we also have to give them, you know, the core, the core values and stories about how important they are for our survival. Think of the, the Inuit, uh, you know, they had their cultural identity and they were not unhappy. They were not feeling that they were not making any progress, they were happy uh, values. Then we also have embrace complexity, you know, learn that just this complexity is very creative. It's gonna help us to move forward as long as, you know, we embrace complexity and non-linearity and do not expect to control where we're gonna go. But like Donava Meadow said, swing the system. Learn to be adaptive and iterative research, etc. And of course, co-responsible learning. No, nobody, you know, not our generation can teach the young people how to do it, but they have to be given the responsibility and you know uh, the, uh, the, the space where they can take the responsibility for their own future and co-create within the framework that we offer them. We're not saying, "Hey, we did it wrong. Go and go and find something better." We are offering them 
frameworks like the SDGs and you know, the Anthropocene map and the timelines, and that usually inspires them greatly. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Anne, and uh, you answer your question probably, can we trust our uh, thinking? Well, if we are aware that uh, putting ourselves uh, above nature can just uh, make us go in the deep bottom, then it's clear. The time is very short, so I will ask uh, also the next speaker, Ananta Duryajabba, that is the president of the director of Matama Gandhi Institute of Education for Peace and Sustainable Development in New Delhi, India, and he's also a fellow of our academy. So please, at 12 minutes, at 10 minutes, I would let you know by sound. Okay. Well, thank you, Alberto. He's a pretty tough taskmaster, so I'm going to straight get into the presentation. I think many of the problems have already been identified. In fact, as the, both the speakers were going on, I was saying, there's not much left for me to say, but, uh, I'll, but I'll still take my 12 minutes. Uh, so what I, this uh, uh, key message of finding came out from the recent IPBES, which is the Intergovernmental Panel on Science on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, similar to the IPCC, but focusing on biodiversity and ecosystem services. And here you got, one million of Earths. These are kind of pretty uh, problematic findings that we are finding here. We are on the, as supporting the what Susan has already talked about as a, a veto, that we are on a downward spiral here, and it's a vicious downward spiral. And in many cases, kind of driven by our own what I would sort of say predatorial instincts, which has you know from from evolutionary to survival mode, and we are still in a survival mode. I'm wondering whether we have actually reached a point where it's a tipping point where we don't need to be in a survival mode. Uh, I wanted to throw in the third one, which is not part of the IP best, which kind of shocked me a little bit because as somebody who's new to India, when I took up this position, and this was a WHO report in 2015, it was saying 25% of children between the ages of 13 and 15, for me, kids of 13 and 15 should be having a, you know, should be having fun should be playing around, uh, not thinking about uh, uh, problems, maybe not of the world, but at least their own particular problems, but have some form of mental illness. And these are only reported numbers. So the numbers must be much, much more staggering. And a lot of that is driven by the education system. It is driven by the education system for one reason, like recently they had a release of the, the so-called, the famous results of, I think it's at grade eight or 10, and on that particular day itself, 12 kids committed suicide because of the results that they received were not as high to the expectations. And many in times, it's the parents who are primarily the main driver of this. Okay. Uh, that was not supposed to be blank, but <laughs> okay. So these are some of the things that we kind of seeing, uh, you have heard about global wicked problems, uh, anxiety, depression, uh, WHO says this is one of the biggest uh, challenges that we're going to face in the 21st century. Uh, intolerance of violent extremism growing, that's uh, you read it in the papers on a daily basis. And the last one is the cost of education. You know, education now has become a, a really good lucrative business rather than being a, a social good in, it, in what is true nature it should be. So if we know what's wrong, why do we still do it? Is it just a human character, uh, characteristic? I look at where I am right now. I live in Delhi, and many of you must have heard of Delhi, especially it's, got its, uh, it's become quite famous recently. We are the most polluted city in the world. When I talk about really pollution, you live it. Uh, I took up this position when I was about 55, 56 years old, never had bronchitis asthma. In the first winter that I was there, I had a bronchitis asthma attacks. Uh, it's frightening. It, you, you have oxygen cut to your brains, you, 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 you have uh, seized out, you've collapsed. And I've never had this in my life. And this is a perfect daily thing that every, we face on a day-to-day -day basis, and yet we don't do anything. Why? 
I don't have any answers. So I think the thing is we are confronted with competing choices. So in a sense, what I'm kind of alluding to is this cognitive dissonance that goes on in our brains on our daily life. You have to balance different things. And so I look at that as a collective uh, problem. I look at some of the more individual-based problems that we face on a daily-to-day -day basis. Your conditions of stress, you're looking at job security, you want to maintain your same lifestyles, or as we have come to worship material wealth. I don't know how many of you are on Facebook. I'm thinking of actually getting out of Facebook because all I see is they always say, who's the richest person in the world? It's like, who cares? But this is what it seems to be making news rather than saying, who's the kindest person in the world? How many of you have heard of Matthew Ricard? Apparently he's supposed to be the kindest person in the world. He's been, all right, two days. Fantastic person, but we never hear of him. Instead of that, we hear Jeff Bozos and did I say Bozo or Bozo? <laughs> I hope I got his name properly pronounced. And the others. And it's like we got our matrix of success. Something is wrong with what we are doing. And I think many of the earlier presentations have already alluded to this particular point. So how do we break it? Right? Is education the solution? I don't think so the way that we have right now. I don't think this is the solution. I live it. I had my seven-year-old son was diagnosed as silly, uh, dumb, a failure. This was at seven years old. It came from an education system, which is not, you know, we were in the Netherlands at that time. They just couldn't. But we diagnosed him as acute dyslexic. And he had a, sp a visual capacity at the 99%. He could do jigsaw puzzles backwards. He doesn't need to see them. So he's got different strengths, but the education system kind of already has stamped him as, as that. So we need a different system that looks at kids as each individual kid who has their strengths and their weaknesses and how do we address those. And it's competitive. When I, when I was in school, when I come back, I re still remember this very vividly. My mom keeps telling me not to say this anymore in public lectures, but it's such a great uh, story. That when I came back with a, I had hit an 85%. And she was so, and I was so excited. I was like 85% because I had hit 60% before. And the first thing she says is, so who, what was the highest uh, who, who scored the highest? And I said, eh, 99%. Well, hey, not good enough. So the pressure is there. Rather than sort of saying, hey, I've improved since that I'm learning, that was not. So, but, and it's inbuilt. I tr and I have to watch myself when I w do it with my kids. So it's an automatic response, which goes in my brains. And immediately what I have to think, that's my system one thinking, kicking in very quickly. And I have to really now have trained myself based on my own experience. My system two tries to not let the system one hijack and sort of say, it's okay, have they improved? Are they, and rather than doing this competitive. And I really don't think the assessments that we have do any good. They don't measure learning. I don't know why we continue again. So it comes back to the cat slide. Why do we continue doing this? I came across a 2014 letter to the Guardian, not to the Guardian, to the OECD, written by some of the top educationists around the world, 80 of them, making a pleading for the OECD to stop doing PISA. It does more damage than good. It still continues. And now, in fact, they are even spreading it across more, uh, more, across more countries. So downward spiral. So this is the system that we have. It's very instrumentalist, which means it's about getting uh, output, getting, a, getting as high qualifications as you can, getting the best job you can, getting the most amount of income that you can get with nothing else in mind, right? And it's just going back. So a newer form of education is required, and I want to focus really on the emotional dimensions. 
we tend to slide emotional intelligence uh, as something that is not part of a formal education system. I think many of you will say in the past this was done within communities. Maybe, I don't agree with that, what I think it would have done in the past is that you have families and they build this emotional intelligence just within yourself and maybe within the broader community, but you still look at anything outside as the other. So we, we, we are really good at doing the othering among groups that don't look like us or don't believe with our values. We tend to do the othering and stuff. And emotional intelligence is about looking at those particular issues. And so what I want to show you is an approach that we have done. So we got the rational and the emotional brain, and what, and what some of the latest research on neurosciences sort of say is they don't, they're, not, they're not separate. Your actions are not coming from the emotional side or it's not coming from the cognitive side. It is based on an interplay between the two. It's a matter of how well they are trained in the sense of finally dictating your final behavior. So Kahneman's work on system one, system two thinking is really uh, goes towards this, but the, the, the work that I really uh, have enjoyed, I'm an economist by training, I'm a dumb economist by training, but the work that Robert Sapolsky has done in the work on behave talks about really about how these interrelationships work in terms of and uh, making some sense of the system one and system two. So we need a new approach, one based on science and evidence. I, very, I found it very interesting that coming into education, it doesn't seem to be really informed by the latest science that's coming out on the science of learning. Cognitive science, the neurosciences, the psychology. It seems to be still driven by very old-fashioned education-based schools. When you talk about evidence, they don't seem to understand evidence. When you talk about science, they don't seem to understand science. Tell you a little bit, if Alberto gives me some time at the end, about an initiative that we are taking on at UNESCO. So this is the whole brain approach to education. We want to stimulate those networks, which is basically from the emotional to the cognitive. I will talk a little bit about what we call this. But this is what we have found from the neurosciences is in terms of activating this neural network automatically every time within your three pound structure that you carry between your years. This is what we have developed at the Institute. It's called Libre. We have this uh, program where we focus on mindfulness. The mindfulness is about self-regulation and emotional regulation, which means within yourself. I think Susan talked a little bit about that. Understanding yourself, understanding, finding peace within yourself. You can't find peace if you can't find peace within yourself. And most of us are so stressful and so in most of the time, lots of anger, frustration. We need to uh, try to calm down and get that stress free. It's not easy. The next one is empathy is about the other, trying to understand the other from their perspective, not from your perspective. What we find is when people talk to each other and we, we, when we try this listening exercise, most people don't listen. They're already trying to react to the other based on their perspective and not from the other perspective. Extremely difficult. The third one is compassion, is some doing something about it. So once you have the empathy, do something about it, and not just sit there and be an idle standby. And a critical inquiry, we built it into it because we wanted to also instill the whole notion of inquiry. Question, question, question. Our education system really doesn't support that. Even when you talk about critical thinking, it sometimes doesn't get into the question approach. Teachers don't like this. So the minute I put that and talk about questioning, 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 they all look at me as, oh, God, he's opening up a can of worms here. But this is what, and the, the, the modules that we have developed, let's say one on violence, starts off with this interesting uh, idea of critical inquiry. It's very interesting when we do in India, when you talk to, we did this with 10-year-olds, uh, and the first thing is, who's your, who's your, who's your enemy? Pakistanis. What do you do? We kill them. What, 10 year olds? They want to kill every Pakistani? Like, why? And then when we start buying, then they kind of, well, we've been told to. They say, so what do you happen if the, that Pakistani that you want to kill has children like you? They say, oh no, then we shouldn't kill parents. 
we just, just kill the soldiers. And we start, well, soldiers have their parents as well. So it continues, and then they sort of say, hey, makes no sense what my original idea is. And within that, we build in the empathy training, compassion training. So we don't do it separate. We do it integrated within the concept. So we do climate change, get them all excited, frustrated, and then bring in this kind of perspectives. And we do it across cultures. We do it, we do it with students in the US, Norway, India, Bhutan, Sri Lanka, very, very different cultures, very different perspectives. And it's really interesting to see their different, the way they think about it. So we call it firing Gandhi neurons based from V.C. Ramachandran's work on mirror neurons. And the whole idea is to create this network because I was told to teach Gandhi values and I resisted on teaching Gandhi values. I said, let's try to create the neural networks that might have been going on in that old man's brain. Might hit it, might not. So some takeaways. Trade-offs and cognitive dissonance is a grounded reality. This is what we have to live with, so accept it. It will always be there. The whole idea is to build that emotional intelligence to navigate that dissonance and to try to balance between the cognitive and the emotions. Because every action that you do, even a rational action, is defined by the emotional state. And the third, our education systems have to be transformed to develop emotional intelli intelligence using a whole brain approach. In a sense, don't break it up into just focusing on cognitive. Even when we talk about sustainable development, most of the time I find it as a cognitive exercise. It's about, it's about the cognition, it's about the rationality, rather than trying to get the emotional part into it. And in fact, if you bring in, especially from the indigenous communities and listen to them, you get that emotion with nature. They don't look at it purely as a cognitive exercise. It's about emotions with the nature. And that is what we would need to do. Call to action. This is what we at UNESCO are trying to do. You know how long it takes to get a resolution at the, at the international level. But we want to mainstream SEL education. We, we were involved in an indirect way with the new education policy in India. And there is a paragraph within that whole policy on social emotional learning. So it's part of the new education policy. And in one of the states in India, the Andhra Pradesh government has already legislated an act where teachers have to be given 50 hours of social emotional learning training as part of their B.Ed. courses. So if you go into B.Ed. courses in that particular state, you will have to now do 50 hours of social emotional learning. Because you can't teach to the kids if you, can't, if you yourself are not at that level. So, flourishing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And actually, although there is cognitive dissonance, even denial, Actually, the affirmation of emotional, com uh, emotional competence uh, uh, is even legislated in some uh, uh, state of your country, so there is a hope. The time uh, is running out, uh, so the next speaker is uh, another of our <coughs> fellow, Stefan, and uh, uh, he's also <coughs> medical director of the University of Applied Science uh, in Germany. And 12 minutes, like everybody. I, like everybody. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I'm learn thank you very much. I'm learning from this conference that education is twofold. Preparing for, for the unknown and transmitting uh, relevant knowledge from the past to the future. And the single most important question I'm interested in here in this context is, how can we increase the learning curve? How can we increase creativity in a society? And what is the evidence for that, the empirical evidence for that, on an individual level and on a systemic level? I would like to talk about creativity. So when we're talking about creativity, we're actually not talking about Einstein or Da Vinci or Rembrandt. We're not talking about having a specific talent or having fun, or happiness, or success, or wealth. When you're talking about creativity, you're talking about something that happens in each of us. 724, in 74 
7.4 billion people throughout the entire life. We're talking about something where we explore the world in a unique and individual way. It's something that had never happened before. You can be a very talented medical doctor or a very talented lawyer, but you are not necessarily creative. You might be just simply reproductive. You know, our current system developed in the 18th century. We had about six disciplines. Now we have over 1,000 disciplines to cope with. If you go into PISA and compare 50 points, just to keep that in mind, we're getting back to that, 50 points difference on a country level means about two years difference in education. And it refers to about 0.6% of economic growth, more or less. And if you're talking about changing the, uh, the educational system towards more creativity, we're talking about a 50-year time span from financing and implementing the system of teaching the teachers and then teaching the students and then looking for the outcome. Right? I think we're currently not tapping into the full potentials of what we have in each of us. And I'm going to refer to the so-called Big Five in science. So what can science tell us about how to unleash the full potentials in each of us? How can science unleash creativity? First finding, Heckman equation, okay? We have robust data. You don't have to, actually, you don't have to make pictures. You can have that. The point is, this is the age and this is the return on investment. The older we get, the return on investment for the society and for each of us is getting lower and lower and lower. The return on investment in the first three to five years is up to one to 10, one to 15 per dollar. And the lower graph shows you just the opposite. We spend most of our money um, in higher education and not in lower education. And if in preschooling, we spend 95% of our money on the three to five year old and not on the zero to three year old. If you were smart, we would spend and redistribute that money in a completely different way. Second statement, Haiti findings. Okay, Haiti analyzed 800 meta-analysis, 50,000 single studies. 80 million students, okay? That's quite an elephant. Just to answer one question, and the question is, what really works? And he came up with 136 variables. And the point is, what really works is personal and interpersonal skills. They oversteer institutional and socioeconomic skills by factor two. If you look closer to it, institutional, out of the 136 variables, institutional and socioeconomic factors have an effect size of 0.23. Any personal and interpersonal factors have an effect size which is double as high. So we're talking about concept making, self-evaluation, peer tutoring, feedbacking, metacognitive training, et cetera, et cetera. Third statement, the so-called input-output fallacy. Big story. There is empirically and statistically a link between input and output in education systems. So the more you pour in, to some extent, the more you're getting out, right? Here's input, here's output. This is the school, right? But if you look closer to the data, it looks a little bit different. You know, Brazil spends the same amount of money on education in South Korea, but South Korea has 176 points in PISA more than Brazil. The US have the same PISA points than Poland, but they spend triple as much. Finland spends the same than Spain, but has 80 points more than Spain, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 
So about a fourth of the output can be correlated to the input, to the physical input, meaning tablets, tables, teachers, repaired toilets. But three-fourths are not. They depend on something else. And they depend on something what we rather call not the curriculum and the cognitive skills, like if you want to become a doctor or a physicist or a teacher. This is the cognitive part. This is relatively, I wouldn't say irrelevant, but relatively secondary. What is empirically relevant is the non-cognitive skills. They make the difference in creativity. Okay? This is empirically a building block of non-cognitive factors along the line of a kid. You start with emotional attachment, self-awareness, executive functioning, impulse control, self-coherence, blah, 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 all the way up. And they do not correlate with what you're studying. It doesn't matter what you're studying. They correlate to the non, to the extracurricular part of the whole educational system. How can you improve this non-cognitive, extracurricular parts that would finally increase creativity or the learning curve? Let's call the creativity response. We have abundant, contact me afterwards, we have abundant evidence, for example, that exercise, in-class exercise of yoga, or sportive exercise within the class increases memory consolidation, prefrontal cortex consolidation, gray matter density. We have, oh my God, oh my God. Kronos then, no, not there's no, 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 no. <laughs> we have robust data if you put a kid, if you put a kid in the classroom and have him sitting still running a mindfulness-based program of two minutes, it increases creativity. It doesn't cost a thing. The same is true for rest and sleep and multisensory learning versus digital learning. And the same is true for social competence and also data on nutrition, what they eat, how they eat, etc., etc. Final, the causal link. You know, the point is when you do social science, you always look for causalities. And causalities in the social fields are very rare events. In most cases, you have correlations. But if you look in the databases of education, the real clash between societies is not religion or political systems or the culture. It's the societies that educate their people and those who don't and you find a causal link between the amount of education within the system and, for example, the health outcome. The higher education is, the lower morbidity and mortality is. The higher the education is, the higher the wealth is. If a college degree, you basically earn 15% more. The higher the education, the higher the health. So, a rich mother with poor education has a 50% lower life expectance than a poor mother with a high education. The same is true for happiness or demography. Okay, a non-educated mother has five children and an educated one has 1.2. The same is true for ecology and the same is true for our democracy. With a time lag of two decades, of heavily investing in the education, we end up with democracy. So, oh, this is the wrong side here. Here we go. The take home message is I think this, we cannot not learn. And if we look at findings in science, we might rethink the way we do education, okay? And learning isn't education, and learning is not necessarily creativity. And I want you to take home that the cognitive, curricular aspects of becoming a, 
a teacher and the non-cognitive aspect are two different things. And if you consider findings in psychology and lifestyle changes, you, know, you can increase creativity in each of us and in society. Last sentence. Education, the difference between education with or without creativity is with creativity, we start enacting and enabling, we start envisioning new ideas in a unique way. Education without creativity is we became postmen that deliver a letter from A to B and never open the mail. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stefan, for uh, this uh, relevant uh, and uh, well-documented uh, support of a fact. Creativity is uh, the only way to go out of the box uh, and have a, a positive future. And uh, sometimes we kill uh, creativity. Now, the time uh, is really extraordinarily gone uh, for respect uh, of the people that are in the next session in this room, uh, three questions. Yes, yeah, second, uh, and the lady there, third. We have uh, three questions. We uh, have taken uh, 20 minutes out of those people waiting to speak. Thank you, Mila. Thank you. Well done. Sure. Back quick. There is no time. Okay, about something that I have called uh, PMD, a smug response to PMS, seriously, which means um, patriarchal mentality disorder. Uh, that is the psychosocial disorder of the hyperactive masculine aggressive principle, with that being said, with women who have patriarchal attitudes and capacities, okay? So that we are unable. <coughs> Thank you. That lady, please. Yes, Milena Dragicevic Šešić from University of Arts. And I would like to thank you all four for what you have brought here. But however, I have to say, being someone coming, the only one coming from University of Arts, 
that somehow, although we were speaking about transdisciplinarity, art, arts were not mentioned. You said, one of you, scientific knowledge based on psychology, sociology, anthropology, neuroscience, then based on science and evidence, and so on and so on. But we were always claiming different thinking. We have to learn how to think differently. And what I want to plead for the next fifth conference <coughs> on education, please invite artists. I am coming from University of Arts, but I am also scientific scholar. And we really need more of that to come up, because you even excluded art, speaking on creativity. You said it's not about Leonardo da Vinci and so on. Of course it's not. Creativity is in science also, it's in everyday life, it's in our way of thinking everywhere. But I think it would be more beneficial if we could make those platforms really uh, transdisciplinary and